this morning. Come on, let's sing it out. I'm not gonna wait, wait for the walls to fall. Cause I know the name that will bring them down. And I've got a praise waking within my soul. And I'm not ashamed to declare it. destroy them oh, up from the grave he's with us now we say light of the world tremble in the darkness nothing can stop it you are the God of the promise every word morning together. Come on, we sing this out. The gates of hell will never stand a chance. Your name prevails. Jesus, the great I am. No word will fail. No weapon formed against. Your name prevails. Jesus, the great
you're never gonna let me down. We sing this together. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. Come on, we sing. As we move into this time of communion, I encourage you to take these moments to remember and reflect. Remember the ultimate sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made for sinners like you and me. Remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With that, I also encourage you to reflect on the state of your mind, body, and soul. We are instructed to examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup. COVID-19 has brought out many emotions in me, and I confess to you this morning that not all of them have been God-honoring. I have sinned throughout this process, and with anger, with anger, and defiance, or the thought of. Some of those sins I have reconciled with God, but others I've been too ashamed to, so I've ignored them. I've pushed them to the side. Communion is the time for me to bring those that have not been reconciled to the cross and accept the forgiveness and grace that comes with Jesus' death. I encourage you to do the same, for we know that in this world we will have trouble, but take heart, he has overcome this world.
Well, hey, good morning, church. Man, we are so excited that you're with us today. Um, I, I, As you can tell, I am not Phil. I am a little bit darker than Phil is, and I'm also a lot hairier than he is. Uh, my name is Juan Fayez, and I get the privilege of being the student pastor here at Valley View, and also uh, I get the opportunity to give Phil a much-deserved uh, week off. And man, I am so excited to share with you this message that God put in my heart a few months ago. Um, and speaking of excited, what 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 gets you excited? Um, actually, go ahead and turn over to your neighbor or, or somebody that is with you there at your home, wherever you're watching this. Maybe you're still in bed. Uh, maybe you're in the living room drinking a cup of coffee and eating pancakes. That's usually what Elkie and I do in the mornings when we watch sermons. But go ahead and turn to whoever you're with or even comment on the chat below. What gets you excited? What gets you pumped up? Because that is what we're going to be talking about today, and that is excitement. Uh, the title of my sermon is hashtag get excited. Uh, we added the hashtag because I'm the student pastor, so I need to be trendy. Um, so there you go. If you don't know what a hashtag is, now you do. Uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And one of the things that gets me excited and gets me pumped up about life is football. I love football. And not just any kind of football. I love New Orleans Saints football. And one of the best moments in Saints history happened February 7th, 2010. I remember that day. Uh, that would be the year that I, I would later graduate high school. Um, but I remember February 7th. I remember the smell of the pizza. I remember the taste of the soda in my mouth. I remember the smell of the cast on my arm because I had uh, actually broken uh, a bone a month before that. And that's a story for another time. I was in the youth room at Chandler Christian Church in Arizona where I grew up. And, we're, and I'm watching the Super Bowl. And the game started off super one-sided, which, by the way, if you are a Colts fan or a Peyton Manning uh, career fan, this is going to be rough for you to relive, but just hang with me. Um, the game started super one-sided. We, we kicked two field goals, but the Colts were just better than us, and, and we went into the half losing 10-6. to six. Now, this leads me to the first moment that I remember getting up out of my seat with excitement. The game would start with us kicking off to the Colts, and instead of just a normal kickoff, Sean Payton decides to go for a trick onside kick. And this is something that doesn't get done very often, if at all, and also it doesn't get done in the biggest football game in a team's history, which is the Super Bowl. Uh, but Sean Payton goes for this onside kick, and it's a, it's a trick. The Colts weren't expecting it at all, and, and we recovered the ball. And I remember standing up out of my seat and jumping with excitement because I was so pumped that my team was going to get back in the race, and that they did. They would fight tooth and nail to climb back up to 24-17 Saints winning. Five minutes left on the clock, and there's a problem. We have to give the ball back to the league MVP in Peyton Manning. Now, if you're from Denver or you're a football fan, you know what Peyton Manning can do if you give him too much time on the clock. He's one of the most clutch quarterbacks that has ever existed, and we had to give the ball back to him on the biggest stage that there is in football. So he would go to drive all the way to the red zone, and, it, and this play is the play that sealed the deal. He would, he would take the snap, he would drop back, and he would step in and throw a laser to Reggie Wayne. Now, this is a throw that Manning had been making the entire game. So inevitably, everybody assumes it's going to be a completion, first down, and they're probably going to score. However, something different happened this time. Tracy Porter would go to jump that route and run it back for six. And that would seal the victory for the Saints and get them their first Lombardi trophy. And they would win it 31-17. Now, when I tell you I was excited, man, that is an understatement. I was over the moon. I, I, I was jumping. I was yelling. I was running around like crazy. I was that annoying youth group kid that, that wouldn't shut up. For the rest of that week, it didn't matter if, if somebody cuts me off in traffic or if my teachers were the worst or if my mom was nagging me about something or, or if my tennis coach was mad at me because I couldn't play my varsity season because I had a cast on. It didn't matter because that feeling of excitement of my team winning the Lombardi was, was awesome and it carried me through the week. And I'm sure you can think of something that you are passionate about, uh, you know, that gets you excited, that feeling of joy and glee and, and just happiness that comes when something awesome happens in your life. And for the, for the rest of the message, I actually want you to remember that feeling because we're going to be talking about excitement today. Because we're really good about getting excited about some things, but when is the last time that we got excited to come into God's presence and to show up at church? Now, 
you probably know where I'm going with this. What, when is the last time that we got excited about what God is doing in his kingdom and even in our local church? And I'm not saying that everybody falls into this camp. Don't hear me wrong. There are some people that are walking, talking, glowing testaments of the beautiful and awesome life that God has given them. And they rejoice in that. But, but some of us at times, we walk in here like we're back in grade school and like our calculus teacher sent us to go talk to the principal. You know, head down, kind of down about it, kind of shuffling our feet. And so today, I want to talk about three reasons or three shifts that we can all make to get excited about God and get excited about church. And I'm going to explain this to three different outfit or shirt changes, um, if you'll allow me. After all, I'm a youth pastor, so I use illustrations, uh, so I hope that, that this resonates with you. So are you ready? We're going to be jumping right in. Um, but before I say anything, I want, to, I want to make a point of saying this. If any of the things that I say here upset you or rub you the wrong way, chances are they apply to something that you're doing. Um, and, and hey, we welcome all complaints, um, and they should all be uh, sent to our complaint department, which is uh, philip.holland at valleyviewcc.com. He would love to take on all those for you. Uh, that being said, let's hop into our first point. The first shift I want us to make is a heart shift. Shifting from being interested to being invested. Now think about it. What are your hobbies? What are things that, there are things that bring you excitement. Uh, take this jersey, for example. This jersey was a Christmas gift from my mom uh, when I was in college, and it is my favorite team, and it's not a cheap jersey, and I don't say that to brag, but I say that more to prove a point. And I don't only own this jersey to prove my fandom. I own three other jerseys, two hats, actually counted all this, a beanie, a scarf, a polo, two T-shirts, and tons and tons of decorations that all are about the New Orleans Saints. Now, why do I do this? Well, because I, like many of us, invest in things that I like. Uh, subsequently, the things that I invest in bring me happiness. I love watching Saints football, and I really love watching Saints football when they're winning. Um, I'm not invested only financially, but I also invest in Saints football with my time. Um, I've given up an entire day to be at a game. I have picked a vacation spot solely based on the fact that the Saints are playing in that city. I, have, I, I leave Sundays after we're done here at church. I will race home to catch whatever's left of the game. I will turn down plans with friends if the game is going on unless I get to watch it while I'm with them. And if you know me at all, you know that I don't miss hanging out with people by any means. Um, you know, I love hanging out with people, but if the Saints are playing, I'm watching the game. Because the reason is we invest in things that excite us. And when we invest in things, they get exciting. My guess is that a lot of us don't get excited about what God is doing in his church and in his kingdom because we're not investing. And I say us because before I became a pastor, I was that same type of person. I, I used to go to church to check it off my list. I used to, you know, show up, check it off my list, throw some money in the, offer, in the offering plate if I had any cash on me, uh, take communion, go on with my day. And this is while I was still in Bible college. The church didn't become my home away from home until Elkie and I started investing. Um, I, I, we started to serve in the youth ministry and at, at our old church, and our outlook completely changed. I met some of the greatest people through serving at the church, and Elkie would go on to meet her best friend through serving at the church. The church became our family. It became our safe place for us. It became the place that we enjoyed going to and loved going to, and ultimately this church would go on to send us to here to Colorado. I was thinking about this, and if it wasn't for the fact that we invested in Hope City, I wouldn't be here, because I invested in Hope City, and that led me to get to know Cody Walker, who was the head pastor of Hope City Church. And if I wouldn't have known Cody, then when Phil called Cody looking for recommendations, Cody wouldn't have dropped my name to Phil. And without that rec, I would have never gotten this job, and I probably wouldn't be standing on this stage or uh, talking to you through your screen this morning. None of that would have happened if we hadn't invested. In the book of Matthew, we encounter one of Jesus' most famous passages, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he's talking to a massive crowd of people uh, and going over all kinds of things, like murder, divorce, stealing, etc. And I want to look um, at that passage in Matthew. So Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this passage, but it's very clear what it's saying. And in other words, he's saying, where is your treasure, church? Where your investment is, there your heart will be also. Are you too invested in your sports team? Tell you what, the New Orleans Saints never died for me. Are you too invested in your job? Did your employer walk on water and save everybody's sins? Are you too invested in your hobbies? Parents, this next one's for you. What does your kids see you investing in? Because whatever they see you investing in is something that they're going to hold to a higher standard when they grow up. It says it right here in, in Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the ways he should go. Even when he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. Why wouldn't we dump all of our assets into church? Why wouldn't we invest in the only thing that is guaranteed to give you 100% ROI, return on investment? Everything else fades, but I have never met somebody that said that their life was made worse because of church. And, I, and you may be thinking, well, gosh, Juan, what do you want us to do? You want us to sell all of our things and give our money to the church and time and do nothing else with our lives? Man, not at all. I, I think that God rejoices in us having hobbies. I think vacations and staycations are necessary. I think that it's okay to work hard for the things that you have. And I think God is okay with us having a well-rounded life. But I think what I'm actually saying is that we need to start investing in the church the way that we invest in everything else. That is number one surefire way of getting pumped up about what is happening here. And that leads us to our second shift. This is a mindset shift, and it's shifting from church is something we get to do, not something we have to do. Now, we all know as Christians we need to go to church, and it's understood, and it's an important part of the Christian walk. The issue is I feel like we don't shift from that mindset after we get started. We keep the same mindset and feel forced, feel like we have to be here. You know, when I was in college, I worked a ton of different jobs. I, I, and none of them were ministry related, and they were just jobs that I had to pay the bills. At one point when Elke and I were engaged, I was unloading uh, trucks at Target at 5 a.m. I was working at a gym. I was uh, working at a supplement store selling vitamins and snake oils. And, and I also was working at Best Buy, um, which leads me to my first wardrobe change. Now understand this, I am so grateful for Best Buy as a company. They taught me leadership skills and all kinds of things that I'm able to use now. Um, but I knew that this wasn't my forever job. You know, I had to go to work at Best Buy. And honestly, eight out of 10 days that I woke up and went to Best Buy to work, I didn't want to be there. But I did because I had to. And this isn't a shot of the company. This was just because I knew that it wasn't what God ultimately had for me. But how often do we feel this way about church? You know, we, we drag our feet on Sunday morning because 10, 15 a.m. is so early. And, and we come because we have to. No wonder we aren't excited. People don't want to do things that they don't want, that they feel like they have to do. You know, think about this. You have to brush your teeth, but nobody's cartwheeling to the bathroom at night to brush your teeth. You have to pay your taxes, but nobody is doing a firework display as they're walking to H&R Block to give the government your hard-earned money. Uh, you have to update the tags on your vehicle, but I promise you I wasn't dancing into the DMV to pay $300 for my truck that I already paid taxes on the first time. This is what I mean. We have to stop treating church as something we have to do and shift our minds to something we get to do because we have that freedom. Now, I came across an article from the Gospel Coalition, and it's written by Sarah Barat, and it's titled, What the Persecuted Church Can Teach Generation Z. And I think it's not just Generation Z, I think it's all of us. And it starts with a few stories. People like 15-year-old Roy. Roy from Indonesia, who at, at that age of 15, he was attacked by a Muslim mob, and they would tell him to renounce his faith, or they would kill him. His final words on this earth were, I am a soldier for God, and I rely solely on Christ. Or what about 19-year-old uh, me from Laos? She had been a Christian for a little bit over two months until a guard from her village put an AK to her head and told her to let go of her religion, and if she didn't renounce her beliefs, she would be shot. Her final words were, you can kill my body, but not my spirit. Church, 
there are millions of stories like these of people that choose Jesus every day and they would die for the ability to worship him freely the way that we get to. Please don't view church as something you have to do or a chore, but view it as a privilege. I, I, a quote from her article that summarizes her point perfectly is this one. It says, I saw my apathy, reluctance to spend time with Christ, read his word and be with his people. In stark contrast to, per, to persecuted believers, commitment to those same things. I became aware of how little I've actually given for Jesus in comparison to how much others have laid down. I'm thankful for religious freedom, but freedom can also sow seeds of complacency. I don't long for persecution, but I do long to be shaken out of my apathy. I've heard of Christians in China praying for persecution to come to America since they know persecution deepens your walk with God. Church, do not kid yourself because the scriptures talk about persecution. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13, it says it right here. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you a partner with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the entire world. World. Suffering for being a Christian isn't shameful because Peter and the apostles were persecuted and they rejoiced. Act 541. But freedom can sow seeds of complacency. And I think that is why we struggle to view this as something that we get to do because we're not risking our lives being here. None of us are risking anything coming through these buildings and worshiping God. There's no cost. There's no investment for us to do this. You want to be excited? We want to be excited and give God truly our all? Well, we have to learn that this is a get-to, not a have-to, because people are dying to trade places with us. And that leads me to my third and final shift I have for us to consider, and that is a God shift. Now, we have forgotten, I feel like in the Western church, we have forgotten the God that we serve sometimes, and we underplay it. Do we serve a God that is small, or do we serve the massive God of the Bible? You know, when David uh, recovers the Ark of the Covenant in 2 Samuel 6, he jumped for joy, and he was actually half naked. And, uh, well, actually, that leads me to my next wardrobe change. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm actually going to spare you guys that right now. Uh, my stomach hasn't seen the light of the sun in many months, so I'll spare you the pastiness that it is. But I will change out of this so it's not so distracting. I felt like we needed a little bit of humor right there. It, it, it has been kind of heavy, but that is what I want us to focus on in this third point, and that is the story of David when he recovers the ark. Now, church, we know that God is great, right? We, 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 but I feel like it's easy for us to underplay the true marvel and power of God in our lives. You know, we get excited about, about God's sovereignty. We love hearing about God's sovereignty. And hey, we even love seeing it here at church because we do see it. We see God's sovereignty in baptism. We see it in gatherings. We see it in children learning. We see it in helping out a neighbor. We see it in, in our small groups. But hey, don't forget that we walk a hollowed ground when we step inside of a church. Now, yes, the spirit of God exceeds past these four walls, um, that I'm recording in right now and that we meet in usually, but this is still a house of worship that God blessed us with. And now if we truly remember the God that we serve and we view him as such, then I have a hard time believing that we wouldn't be ecstatic anytime we step into his presence. I like the way Annie Dillard puts this in her quote, and she says, on the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. Now, I don't think we're going to start handing out helmets and life preservers, but there is something that we can learn from this quote. Have we lost that holy fear and reverence that the early church had for God? I mean, in the times of the Old Testament, you couldn't even set foot in the presence of God without a certain list of qualifications or you'd be struck dead because it mattered. 
Now, in Stephen Olford's book, The Tabernacle, Camping with God, it, be, it, it brings up a really cool point that I love, and that is that there are two chapters in the entire Bible devoted to creation, but there are 50 devoted to the tabernacle and the building of the tabernacle and also how we step in front of God. You can't tell me that's a coincidence. Now, again, I know what you're probably thinking. Well, Juan, that was the Old Testament, and things aren't like that anymore, and we can come to God as we are. Hey, you're 100% correct. I, I love being part of a church that's relaxed, and I can wear a T-shirt, too, every Sunday morning. But I think it's this lax attitude that has led us to become stagnant in our church attendance, and that has led us to become stagnant in our reverence for God and our excitement, and it can be found in the Western church. Now, we love praising God when he works miracles. We, we love to see the sick healed and our finances bounce back and relationships restored. But when these things haven't happened in, the while, in a while, where is the joy? Where is the zeal, church? Why do we have such a hard time remembering the God of the Bible? The God that created the world, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses that split the sea, the God of the Israelites, the God that provides, Jehovah Jireh, the God of armies, Jehovah Sabaoth. Because that is the God that we serve, church. It's the same God that brought down fire on Mount Carmel when Elijah was challenged and he beat the prophets of Baal. That is the same God that is still here acting today, and we need to remember that. We don't worship a dead God. We worship a God that is living and takes care of his people with one hand, and with the other hand, he holds a sword and fights for us. To get re-energized and excited about church means to remember the reason we even do this. To serve and worship a living God that is immensely more powerful and loving and caring than we could ever imagine. A God that does not need us, but wants us. And how awesome is that? Please hear my heart, church, when I say this. I'm not out here getting loud because I want to scare people or to make you feel guilty. I am here because I want you to be set on fire for God. Metaphorically, of course, I hope none of you are actually set on fire. I think it's even more apparent in the state that we are in right now. Our, our church meetings have been taken away from us. And it may be a while until we're back in the same building together and under the same room. And I, and I want this time, I want us to use this time and these memories of longing to be back at church to come back with excitement. Remember, we have to invest in God with what he has blessed us with. Whether that is our money, our time, our talents, but we have to invest. We have to remember that we get to do this. We can't look at Sunday mornings as something that we have to do. We have to look at Sunday morning as something that we get to do because people are dying to trade places with us. And finally, we have to remember the God we follow. He doesn't go away when life is going well, and he most certainly does not go away when life is rough. He's the same God that we read about in our Bibles, and if we focus in his power and sovereignty, I think we will have an easier time getting excited about what he's doing in our churches. I'll leave you with this verse from 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 15. Don't worry, I'm not going to take my shirt off again. It says, And David danced before the Lord with all of his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. Church, let's be more like David and maybe even dance a little. Would you pray with me? Father God, I... Uh, Lord, I thank you for this church. Thank you for Valley View and, and just for how dutifully we, we worship you and we follow you, Lord. Thank you for a chance that we get to get together and learn about you. And Father, would you set a fire in our hearts to come back and to worship you and to, and to be living images of Jesus. Would you set a fire in our hearts to get excited about what you're doing in your world, Lord, and, and to hurt whenever there is hurt and injustice in this world, just like your heart hurts. God, would you, when all these things are lifted and we're back to being able to meet in person, would you allow us to come back rejoicing and joyful and excited and to really, really appreciate the freedoms that we have and are able to use here. Father, thank you again for this place. Thank you for your son Jesus and his sacrifice. And I pray that every day of our lives, you remind us of who we are and whose we are. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll see you next week, church.
God, we, we are your broken vessels that you use. We praise you, God, that you use ordinary people like us to make your kingdom strong. God, you use the weak. So God, would you fill us up with your amazing Holy Spirit? God, we love you. We sing to you now. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closed. When I look at the space between where I used to be in this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing 
next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea But should I ever need a reminder Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Another died for me There is another in the fire All my dead, all my dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning?
I'm Philip Hall, I'm the pastor here at Valley View Christian Church. This is Virginia Allen, my youngest daughter. We're excited that you just joined us for a few moments to watch this service. We're more excited about the church and we hope that you are too. Juan did a phenomenal job with his message today. Now there's a variety of ways that you connect with our church. And one of those particular ways that we appreciate so much is your contributions. It is by your giving that we can be the church that God is calling us to be. And so we wanna encourage you to give back, to help support the mission of our church, to help families follow Jesus. And you can do that by going to our website, clicking on the give tab there, and you can give a one-time or reoccurring contribution. You can also do it on our Facebook page where there's a link there to give and contribute to the mission. It is your contributions that support ministries throughout the world. One of those particular ministries is Love, Inc. It helps families here in our local community. They help families with their utilities, with gas cards, with clothes, with foods, a variety of things. And so every month we send them money to help to meet those particular needs in our area. Another need that they have is diapers and wipes. And so as a church, we're doing a diaper drive right now. And we wanna encourage you to come by our church to drop off diapers, drop off wipes, and we're gonna donate them to this particular ministry to help meet that basic need that these families have. Because I know how Virginia was, and I know how my other kids are, and we have needed lots of diapers with our children, and we know that there are families in this city that need that basic need met. I know, baby. That's right. And my Virginia here is ready to wrap this up. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. If you wanna check us out in person, you can do it on our lawn. Um, we would love to have you be a part of that. And it's an in-person service that we are providing. And you can go to our website or our Facebook page or Instagram to get information about the times of that. And we'd love to see you here in person. Now Virginia here needs a nap. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us.